In the Garden of the Rose house in full view, nearly 100 rebels were buried. All around the barn, even within the house yard, within a few feet of the doors were, in numbers, the scantily buried followers of the Confederate cause. 275 were buried behind the barn. A rebel colonel was buried within a yard of the kitchen door. No pen can paint the awful picture of desolation, devastation, and death that was presented here to the shuddering beholder who traversed these localities July 4th, 5th, 6th, 1863. Fences and fruits of the earth had alike disappeared before the withering bosom of destruction. All was a trodden, miry waste with corpses at every step, and the thick, littered debris of the battle-broken muskets and soiled bayonets, shattered caissons and blood-defiled clothing, trodden cartridge boxes and splintered swords, rifled knapsacks, and battered canteens. When a description of such a scene was presented on these fields, is attempted, words have lost their power, and language is weak. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's live stream presentation from right here on the Gaysburg Battlefield. My name is John. I am the tattoo historian, and it's great to be joined by a host of friends here today on the battlefield. It's an awesome day out here. The weather is fine, hopefully great for shooting, and we're going to go over some very deep subjects today. We're going to go over what the battlefield looked like in the days we just after the battle. We're going to go over burial processes, we're going to go over environmental history and so much more today throughout the day we have several stops that we're going to be going to including this one which is the rose farm we're going to be going to the trossel farm area the kadori farm and culps hill uh, at 10 a.m this morning i posted the maps from the elliott maps uh, and i have zoomed into each location so you can either print those off at your leisure today so you can follow along with our program uh, or, if you're watching on a laptop or a desktop, you can open a separate tab so you can blow those up and see them as we go through. But each area of the battlefield today, we will cover part of that Elliott map. Here at Gettysburg, right after the battle, uh, there are approximately 7,000 men who need to be buried on the battlefield and over 3,000 animals. We have to remember how many animals joined along with the the Union Army, the Potomac, and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia at that time. How many pulled the caissons? How many pulled the wagons? And uh, horses and mules littered the field just as much as the men out here. When Alexander Gardner came here, he took many photographs. We'll go over those in a little bit. Many of them shot right here on the Rose Farm. So we are standing in the heart of what we remember as historical memory uh, of the post-battle era here at Gettysburg. I'd like to bring my friend Dr. James Brumall on uh, with me, and we're going to try to socially distance as much as possible today and be good stewards of that. Thank absolutely. you, Jim, for being here. Yeah, thank you, John. I appreciate the invitation. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, as I said, we are staying on the Rose Farm property, and if you uh, are able to pick up the Elliott map uh, location, you'll see the field that we are standing in, and we're going to go over that uh, area here in a little while. This farm was owned by George and Dorothy Rose, who were from Germantown, Pennsylvania. Uh, George's brother, John, actually was here uh, before the battle. He was basically the steward of this, uh, this plot of ground. He was the farmer who took care of all these fields. He knew it like the back of his hand. Uh, he was likely here when Federals uh, moved in, and he spoke with several of them later, which we'll talk about. According to him, though, he says that about 1,500 uh, killed were waiting to be buried in this area. Here where Jim and I are standing is where General Semmes Brigade came through on July 2nd, 1863 to engage the U.S. Army, located in the fields off to our right, or located in the woods off to our right, excuse me. Semmes' men were here for about 24 hours from July 2nd until the early afternoon of July 3rd. At 2 p.m. on July 3rd, they received word that they must retreat back to Seminary Ridge the wood line off to our left distance where they came from on July 2nd. Most likely for two reasons, one being the repulse of Pickett's Charge 
off to their far left, and also uh, the advance of the Pennsylvania Reserves into the Valley of Death, as we would call it, and up Houck's Ridge, going towards the wheat field area, which is just off to our right, several hundred yards away. So they must retreat out of this area and leave behind the comrades who lie here. So Jim, uh, I thought we would go over what people saw here in the immediate aftermath of Sem's men leaving this spot, and also for citizens and, and just curious people who come out here at that time. Yeah, so word quickly travels, of course, that this massive battle has occurred in South Central Pennsylvania. Word spreads very quickly, electrifies northern audiences as they start learning of the victories that the troops were able to achieve on the second and third. And then on the fourth, not only do we have these major two, two dual victories, but we have major rainfall. So the troops that are sort of waiting, eyeing each other, warily kind of deciding what's next in the phase, are being poured upon by this rain. Very quickly thereafter, between the 4th and the 6th of July, spectators, visitors, mourners, people who are looking for loved ones, start to descend upon this area. And we actually have a quote uh, from a young uh, woman who was in the, uh, in the vicinity that said that the town began to fill with friends and strangers, some intent on satisfying their curiosity, and others, alas, to pick up anything of value to be found. And so we have almost immediately people seeking to memorialize and commemorate this great battlefield by going to scenes like the one that we just recreated and picking up the debris of the battlefield and bringing it home. And eventually there's a whole cottage industry that's created both in Gettysburg and beyond. But I think what's so compelling as we look through these primary source materials is on the one hand, the soldiers have just experienced a battle that they have incredible difficulty comprehending and then represented in written form. They talk about this. But as they're trying to process this loss or this victory, the, the loss of their, their close friends and comrades, their messmates, they then look upon a battlescape that once again begs description. And once again, the pin falls silent. They had incredible difficulty in conveying what exactly had just happened on these fields and the scenes of desolation before you. Now, I'm incredibly happy, of course, the, National, the Gettysburg National Military Park has preserved and commemorated the fields as they have today. It's a battlefield that deserves to be a place of reverence and solemnity, but it also sort of distracts at points from understanding what it probably looked like in the immediate aftermath of the battle. We don't want to recreate that landscape, why would we? But when you come to these sites, I would encourage you to pause and in the mind's eye, not think only about the battle lines and how the contest ebbed and flowed throughout the first, second, and third of July, but then think about that aftermath. What exactly this battlefield looked like? And once again, we have some pretty rich descriptions Detritus laid around the, the area for miles. This is a 25 square mile battlefield. That's a lot of land. Discarded boxes, fouled guns, battered canteens. We have all these ideas. And then, of course, the newly marked graves. The men who have fallen during the contest are now being hastily buried. And between the 4th and the 6th, while Union armies were still on these fields, Many of the soldiers themselves begin the process of burial before it's sort of going to shift gears, as we'll talk about here later. And we have a quote from a sergeant, George Bowen, of the 12th New Jersey Smice Brigade, and he writes, On Sunday morning, all were ordered out to bury the dead and help get the wounded off. We found few living, as they had been laid out there since Friday afternoon in the broiling sun and in the rain of Sunday, oh, Saturday and Sunday night. Many are dead that could have been saved if we had been allowed by the enemy to have cared for them. The ground here is very hard and rocky. The digging is laborious work. The dead are many. The time is short. And here's the hero in part. So they got the very shallow graves. In fact, the most of them were buried in trenches, not dug more than 18 inches deep. And so as you're surveying this battle escape on the 4th, the 5th and the 6th of July, you are seeing across your landscape these hastily buried graves. How horrifying is it to Victorian Americans who have such entrenched ideas as we'll talk about today about the good death to see men who had been their comrades, who had been their messmates, who potentially were their relatives, hastily buried across this almost incomprehensible battlescape.
And then beyond that is the horrible scenes that they are going to encounter. We're not terribly far from the famed Plum Run. And once again, I'm going to turn to the words of the participants and the spectators and the, and the citizens that start coming to this field, one of whom observes Plum Run had been, quote, clogged with the dead bodies of Confederates, cut down by the fire of infantry and the terrific missiles of artillery. The water had literally become dammed up by the swollen corpses of the Southern soldiers. The writer then wandered over these fields immediately after the fierce strife had ceased, and the vivid impression of the horrible sights there beheld can never be effaced from memory. Death in the ghastliest and most abhorrent forms everywhere, festering corpses at every step, some still unburied, some hastily and rudely buried with little earth upon them that presented an appearance so repulsive as to if it had been better if they had not been buried at all. And so these are scenes that we obviously shudder from right. and don't think about, but this is what composes the aftermath on this battle escape in Gaysburg, Pennsylvania. And these are the scenes that were seared into the memories of the participants, into the minds of the civilian population, and that's the stuff that they're going to have to work through on a whole host of fronts. Probably most famously, as John alluded to, as to why we are where we are today, is that this particular part of the battlefield becomes quickly immortalized in the American consciousness, indelibly etched through the photographer's lens. And so we know that Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, and Matthew Brady heard word of Gettysburg in early July in Washington, D.C. They make the 75-mile trek, most likely together, out to this area, arriving sometime in the late morning or early afternoon of July the 5th. Very well documented, and of course, that's the work of William Frazzanito, whose book, if you don't have it, Gettysburg, A Journey Through Time, you must get. I've actually used it in the classroom to incredibly good ends. I was a little nervous about the assignment at the time, but the students are mesmerized by it. Right. And Frazzanito, more than anyone else, has documented those photographs and these locations on this battle escape, and we are, uh, we all owe him a huge debt of gratitude for literally the hundreds of hours of work that he put in to, to, re, to, to finding the exact locations and to recreating them for us today. But maybe you want to talk a little bit then about some of the scenes that they were able to capture on this, this area of the Rose Farm? Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are many scenes that uh, Gardner and his crew capture here. I believe throughout Gettysburg, uh, through the area, he, he photographs about 33 locations or 33 sets of uh, dead on the battlefield. Approximately 27 are done right here on the Rose Farm. So this was indeed a place where uh, a lot of death and destruction was seen by the photographer as a way to convey the message of the Gettysburg battlefield. Uh, through Fresnito's works, as we, were, as, as we just alluded to, we know where to set the tripod today to give you the best look at many of the places where Gardner uh, shot these images from. Uh, one of the main places which I have said about in the, in the introduction to this uh, event posting last week is that large split rock in the background. Uh, when you can find formations like that, you can understand where these photographs are taken because you can pick out a tree that may be a witness tree, you can pick out a rock which may have a distinctive shape to it, and you can deduce from that rock where certain men were laid, where angles that certain photographs were taken at that time. So it's a nice puzzle to come out here and unwrap uh, throughout your journey onto the battlefield. And the Rose Farm uh, has been so well preserved in that way that you can see uh, the tree line almost is where the tree line was. Uh, you can see the rock formations which are out here. They haven't changed. Obviously, no one's going out and picking up a boulder and running off with it. We know where uh, the bodies were laid out. Uh, there, there are smaller rocks, which like is the one off to my right, uh, which we know that there were, uh, I believe, four or five Confederates were, were around uh, this rock alone. Uh, and then you, when we pan in deeper into the Rose Farm property, we can see the different angles that Gardner utilized his camera apparatus from. There are even uh, locations where he is shooting towards us and behind the camera you can see his wagon from his darkroom wagon. So uh, this is a unique journey into mid-19th century photography 
and the power of mid-19th century photography in America uh, at that time. Obviously, we read a lot about the, his work at Antietam and then the displays of those images after the Battle of Antietam in 1862. Uh, this, again, propels the narrative into uh, the public's eye as far as the cost of the struggle going on. And we still use it, as, as Jim just alluded to, as teaching tools in the classroom or on the battlefield because we have to connect each other with that uh, kind of event in new and different ways than only talking about uh, what brigade did what and what colonel did what. We need to talk about the cost, and those uh, those photographs allow us to do that to this day. Yeah, and importantly, about 75 to 80 percent of all the photographs taken at Gettysburg are of the dead. That yeah. was the main subject matter. About 80 percent of Gardner's images are ultimately stereo views, which are going to create a very realistic, three-dimensional rendering um, of 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 these sites. And the one thing that I would say, and historians grapple with this is I'm not as convinced the 19th century audiences would have been exactly shocked by what they saw, barring some important points. First, most middle class Americans had the ability, they didn't necessarily do it, but if they had the ability, they may very well may have taken a post-mortem photograph of a loved one, if, especially if a child died quite early. So they were familiar with photographs of the dead, but in an intimate parlor setting. What's unusual is that these are strangers being viewed eventually by public audiences in different forms. So it's a very different type of interaction with the photographs. But they're not horrifying enough for audiences to necessarily call for the war to cease, to say that this is madness, we must stop the killing. But they do become very important documentations of just how catastrophic small arms fire, artillery fire is. And they start to think to indelibly etch themselves into the American consciousness because if I were to ask an audience member, when you think of the Civil War, what do you think of? And I, I guarantee there's a whole series of images that will immediately be conjured to mind. It might not be a person, it might not be a place, but it might very well be the horse, the, dunk, the Dunker Church. It might very well be the sharp, Confederate sharpshooter at the Devil's Den. These are images that have shaped our understanding of the war. And how we continue to interact with them, I think, is an absolutely fascinating subject, and that's why I like to use them as teaching tools, as, as do you, um, in the classrooms and beyond. We've, we've, we've done uh, work with the photographs in the field as historical interpreters, uh, especially when the last days of my Civil War interpretive days, uh, I did burial detail, and so we would bring out the photographs, and we would showcase the photos, and we would talk about burial practices and such, which we're going to go through in mass today. Uh, later on, and the order of the good death, which we're going to go into deep detail throughout the day about as well. I think it's also important to know that when Gardner comes out here and takes those images, those bodies still have to be buried. And as, as multiple people have pointed out, uh, they're, they're in the process of being buried at that time uh, as Gardner is, is doing this. Uh, maybe the guys, he said, hey, why don't you take a little break? Here's some whiskey, go off and have a good time. I need to take some photographs. Who knows how he did that? And you can see them in situ as they're they're already lined up, they're right. ready for the burial process, but they're right. but they're not yet quite there. So it's a right. very unusual series of shots taken specifically here. Right, and Fraz Nito actually uh, in, in his later work uh, called uh, Early Photography at Gettysburg, mm -hmm. uh, he actually talks about the Rose Farm again, obviously, and he states that he believes Sems's men actually were moving their men into position for burial or for uh, another purpose when they were asked to leave. And they left the men lined up here. Uh, and there were also federal counts that when the federals came through this area and uh, they, they noticed that the men had already been lined up here uh, in almost as if they said they were in battle line. So that's, that's saying they're, they're getting ready for burial. Uh, but of course here at Rose Farm, that's not uh, the end of the story when Gardner takes those photographs, these men, as we've said, still are in the process of being buried or are still being, uh, uh, are being lined up for burial. I want to thank my friend Tyler Millett, who's working on a great list of the Rose Farm dead. And uh, it, it's going to be a really spectacular list when it comes out. We found people who were moved on this property four to five times, or he has. He's given me the, a, a little background knowledge on that, and it's amazing when you read over that, that the same person is being moved four or five times on one property. Uh, but uh, John Blair Lynn was, a, was an attorney, a former soldier from Union County, Pennsylvania. He's here about three days after Gardner takes those photographs. 
and uh, he's kind of an amateur historian. He wants to document the battle. Of course, as a former soldier, he wants to also take a look at what's going on here. And uh, he goes to the Sherfy farm, which is behind the camera, about a half a mile to a mile away from here. He's walking towards the Rose Farm. He comes to the Rose Farm, and he describes the scene here. We proceed about a half mile beyond to the farm of Mr. Rose. His stone house and large stone barn are to the left of the road, meaning the Emmitsburg Road, the width of a field from it. Here to the north of his barn, we counted 33 graves of the 12th South Carolina Volunteers. They were only slightly covered with earth, and you could feel the body by pressing the earth with your foot. One man's left hand, J.B. Robbins, Company I, 8th South Carolina, one man's left hand, yes, yeah, stuck out of the grave, looking like an old, parched, well-worn buckskin glove. A little further on across the fence was the grave of J.W. Weldon, 53rd Georgia. Near him was that of Captain J.M. DeBond, Company I, 53rd Georgia. On the other side of the barn and lane under a pear tree was the grave of Captain T.J. Warren, 13th South Carolina. And in his garden, Mr. Rose told us, were buried 10 superior officers, colonels, majors, etc. That morning, approximately the 8th of July, he had removed them for fear of injury to the water of his well to a ravine in the woods half a mile east of the house where he placed their headboards beside them and left them unburied, not having the strength or means to bury them. He pointed up to his wheat field and said over 50 rebels were lying in there still unburied. So Gardner captures, captures these images on uh, two or three days beforehand. These men are still lying out here. Ro Mr. Rose has taken men basically the woods to our right and has placed them in a ravine with their headboards and left them because he has no more power to, to bury these men. So you can imagine the landscape days after the fight hasn't really changed that much. Uh, and the environmental impact that Mr. Rose said would happen to his well is one that's very well documented in the modern era by many historians who are environmental historians. Uh, and uh, that's a really interesting story to go along with the overall theme of the campaign. Uh, so, if you look on your, uh, on your map, if you guys have the Rose Farm map from the Elliott map, uh, you will see the field which we are in right now. I'll try to get as close to the camera as I can without blurring the camera. Uh, here is the Rose House and Barn. We are situated about in this area. And you can see it says 500 rebels. These hash marks are all graves of Confederates. If you, if you look in the top corner, you will see the hash marks struck through. Those are federal graves, according to Elliot. But you will see how spread out some of these locations are uh, on the Rose Farm property. And again, I gave you a, a, a copy of this on on, on uh, at 10 o'clock this morning, so you guys can download that. You can print it out and follow along. Uh, you can open up a different tab and follow along as well. But the Elliott map is really a great document to have on hand if you're going to come out here and study the dead. There, there are still parts of it we're still arguing over to this day, which we do with many primary sources, uh, especially of that time period, and especially of the dead, uh, because when I spoke with Tyler uh, Mellett about this part of the battlefield and about the dead here, there were instances where we have no idea where these guys ended up. And that is synonymous with most Civil War battlefields. That's why you have so many that are unknown, uh, who are buried in national cemeteries, who are buried in, in cemeteries in the South. Uh, we don't know where some of these guys ended up. We don't even know if some of them still are out here. And uh, that's, that's one thing that we have touched upon with the National Park Service. And, and it's a really interesting thing to think about. When you're walking out here, you're not only walking on a battlefield, you're also walking possibly on a graveyard. And we have to keep thinking that as we go forward as well. And, and just to give you some sense of how large of a scale problem this is, Faust, Drew, Drew Cook and Faust documents about 40% of all Union dead are ultimately unknown. And the Confederate number is probably likely higher. And so again, I would urge you to, to not only think about the battlefield, but transport yourself to the home front. Think about the, the family members that are awaiting word from a loved one after a great battle like Gettysburg. Word slowly circulating in the newspapers. Rumors are coming through the communities, but they very well may not know the fate of their loved one ultimately, nor the location of where they finally were laid to rest. 
they could maybe have some sense of closure in their minds, knowing that the person at least was killed in action and did die um, according to the ideals to which um, they, by which they lived. But having that body was absolutely essential to Victorian notions of the good death. And in many instances, there are simply thousands of soldiers who never were able to achieve that final sort of resting place. So when you come to Gettysburg, if you ever do, uh, you're going to want to come to this spot because this spot is one of the most well-documented spots on the entire battlefield, only because of the primary resource materials and the photography. And you can come out here and you can see into uh, that, that portion of history by looking at these boulders, thinking of the photographs that were done here. We can never imagine what it looked like, as Jim was saying earlier. We don't want to imagine what it looked like. However, we can't forget that cost. We can't forget the environmental impact. We can't forget the impact of the people, as Jim was saying, on the home front when it comes to the order of the good death, which we'll go over throughout our day today. Uh, that's another reason why I wanted Jim here, because he is the good death man. <laughs> you know, you got to be known by something, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Uh, no, but... It's one of those things that we have to think about the deeper subjects involved here. It's not just military history, it's home front history, it's environmental history. And how do we combine that to make a really interesting narrative for such a wide demographic of people who we want to visit here. So Jim, do you have any last thoughts? Or would you no, like I'm to looking forward to the next stop. All right. Our next stop, we're going to go to the Trossel Farm and we're going to work our way north on the battlefield. So we'll be back with you in a little while, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Share this out. Let, let us know how you feel in the comment section.